and welcome to this Learn All Analysis video course on Elemental ICP and PQ Analysis of Lubricating Oils. Today's video will cover the importance of ICP and PQ tests as they make up most of an oil analysis report. We will also cover the scientific principles behind each test and finally what can be determined by the results. I might add that ICP and PQ are the most interesting values to a person reading the report in that they can tell you which components are wearing, how severe the wear is, and also some of the contaminants causing this. So let's start with ICP, or inductively coupled plasma. We measure the elements because components within the machine have different elemental makeups. These elements can be detected as each element emits a specific wavelength of light when heated to a very high temperature. An immense amount of information can be determined by this single test. The test works by heating the sample to 10,000 degrees Celsius. To give you an idea of how hot that is, the surface temperature of the sun is only around 5,500 degrees Celsius. So next time you get an all sample report, consider how the sample has had to be heated to nearly twice the temperature of the sun's surface during the process. Determining the mix of elements present, such as aluminium, copper or iron, allows a diagnostician to determine the components wearing, so corrective maintenance can be performed before catastrophic failure. For instance, high silicon, aluminium, chrome and iron in your car engine suggests a fault with your air filter, whilst titanium appearing in an industrial hydraulic reservoir tank suggests the paint or coating is beginning to flake off inside the tank. The theory of ICP is that an element in its ground state enters the hot plasma where its electrons get excited and move to a higher energy state. This higher energy state is not stable and the energy is quickly released as a wavelength of light, specific to each element. The higher the intensity of each element specific wavelength, the higher the concentration of the element in that sample. So let's cover this in a bit more detail. Don't worry. You don't need anything more than a basic high school knowledge of chemistry to understand this next bit. On the left is a simplified diagram of an atom, with a nucleus in the middle, and electrons orbiting around it. This is an element in its ground state, and is how the atom will likely be prior to entering the plasma flame. All atoms want to be in their ground state, so if they become excited they will try to return to the ground state as soon as possible. When the plasma heats the atom, it becomes excited, with the electrons moving faster and further from the nucleus. The atom is now in an excited state, which is not stable, and so it has to release this energy to get back to the ground state. This energy is lost as a photon of light. The atom is now returning to the ground state, and its photon, combined with the other atom photons, coloured yellow, go through a diffraction grating, similar to a prism to split the light into their individual wavelengths. These photons reach a photomultiplier tube, or PMT, which enhances the signal up to a million fold as an electrical signal, so it can be detected. With calibration, quality control and ICP algorithm data, the reading is converted to the concentration of each element, usually given in ppm or milligrams per kilogram. So now we understand the fundamentals of the ICP test. Now comes the fun part, in using this information to identify the condition of your machinery. Let's start with wear metals. You can pause the video at this point to read the page, or download my book from learnallanalysis.com, which has all these tables and more. I won't cover every single element combination in this video, but instead select a few common scenarios. Aluminium in engines tends to be from the piston. When seen with chrome from piston rings and iron from the liner, this suggests wear to the upper cylinder. In contrast, in a transmission, aluminium could be coming from the torque converter. Copper on element bearings with a metal cage tends to be cage wear, if the only high element present, which could be a misaligned bearing. Chrome on hydraulics on an excavator or digger suggests wear to those nice shiny chrome plated rods which could be caused by a seal failure. Lead and tin, when also found with copper in an engine, suggest bearing wear. Now onto contaminants, which I think are more important to memorise first, as opposed to wear metals, because if you can remove the contaminant, you can stop the wear, even if you are not 100% sure which component is being worn. Lithium is usually lithium-based grease ingress. 
Sodium and potassium, either together or individually, are often used as corrosion inhibitors in glycol-based engine coolants. So if you found these in your engine oil, it is possible you have a coolant leak. Silicon and aluminium in a 2 to 1 or a 3 to 1 ratio means dirt. If you remember nothing else today, remember that silicon and aluminium suggest dirt ingress. This is because dirt is a mix of aluminium silicates. If you recall early in this presentation, I said silicon, aluminium, chrome and iron in an engine oil suggests an air intake issue. I will now explain how I determine this. Silicon and aluminium suggest dirt ingress, as I've already mentioned. Aluminium can also be from the pistons too. Whilst chrome is consistent with ring wear, there is no high copper, lead or tin, suggesting the dirt didn't come from a dirty oil change or top up and is coming from the upper cylinder. The most likely cause of this is through the air induction system and the fact dirt is getting in suggests an air filter problem. We now come on to metal containing additives. I must start with there are thousands of different formulations, all with slight differences between the different manufacturers. So these rules will not apply to every single lubricant, but there are still some general trends that apply to 95% of lube oils. Let's start with zinc and phosphorus. These pair are most commonly seen as the anti-wear additive ZDDP, found in hydraulic and engine oils. They act by reacting with the surface of exposed metal to form metal sulfides, which are usually stronger than the base metal thus giving an extra strong coating. This is true for most metals, but copper sulfide keeps forming and washing off. Therefore, during the early stages of engine running, the copper levels can spike into the thousands, which is normal and should gradually come down within the first few changes as the copper sulfide layer stabilizes. In gear rolls, ZDDP is not sufficient for the extreme loads and hence an extreme pressure or EP additive of phosphorus without zinc is used. EP releases sulfur at high temperatures, caused by high loads, to give extra protection to components. This sulfur release is also responsible for the characteristic gear oil smell. Calcium and magnesium in combination or singly tend to be used in engine oils as detergent, dispersant and base number additive to keep soot and dirt in suspension and neutralise acids of combustion. I've put some general notes for additive concentrations on screen. But the best thing to do is to send an unused reference oil for comparison to your lab so you have a baseline. As additive formulations are constantly being tweaked by oil companies, so you may find your oil is an exception to the general additive concentrations. Some elements are a bit awkward in that they can come from multiple sources, so not characterised as wear elements, contaminants or additives. This means additional analysis, reference oil and historical trend data is needed to narrow down the source. Molybdenum has a few sources, with it being wear from piston rings, molly grease, or the oil additive molybdenum disulfide that has a synergistic effect with ZDDP, acting similarly to how graphite works as a lubricant, forming sacrificial layers. Titanium can be from titanium dioxide, as in the perfect white colour used as a base for paint. A wear metal in some high-end bearings, and as a marker used by lube oil companies to detect if the oil has been diluted with a competitor's product and to confuse competitors trying to replicate formulations. PQ or PQI or Particle Quantification Index is a useful test that complements ICP very well. This is because ICP works best on small particles, less than 5 to 10 microns. Large particles will still be detected but will be underestimated because not all of them will be nebulized to reach the plasma flame. And also when in the flame, the largest particles will not have as much surface area in contact with the flame as smaller particles. The width of a human hair is around 70 microns. So if you can see a particle, then it is going to be too large to measure by ICP without any underrepresentation. PQ, on the other hand, is a unitless measure of ferrous particles in the sample. The test works by sample cup or bottle rotating through a magnetic field and the disruption to the magnetic field is measured. In the first spin we can see there is very little disruption to the magnetic field and this could be simply background magnetism to give a reading above zero. When we add a sample with a very high ferrous content it causes a high PQ reading as it disrupts the field. PQ does not only measure small particles but large particles too so it is an excellent complement to ICP to measure small and big particles. This is important diagnostically because you can determine if the wear being generated is normal wear, usually less than 15 microns, or large abnormal wear particles.
If ICP iron and PQ are rising together in a trend of historical samples without an oil change, this suggests the increase is in small particles. But if the PQ increases faster than the iron, this means that the abnormal wear process is occurring. If in contrast the iron is rising but the PQ is not, this suggests there is an increase in small, non-magnetic particles, such as rust. Consequently, the combination of PQ and iron is a good prognostic tool in condition monitoring. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed this video, you can download my book that accompanies this video series from learnoilanalysis.com for free. You can also subscribe to this channel and watch my other oil analysis videos listed to the right. Thank you.